evening, everybody. Good evening. Hi. How's everybody tonight? It's great to see everybody here. Last I heard, it was 3-2 Giants in the fourth inning. So we really appreciate you joining us tonight. I'm Dave Jones, and I want to welcome you to Shaken 2. For the next two hours or so, a panel of three experts will talk with you about the threat of disaster that we in the Pacific Northwest all face when the next major earthquake occurs on the offshore Cascadia subduction zone. This fault line has produced earthquakes in the past with magnitudes of 8 to 9 plus on the Richter scale. So it's not really a question of if it will happen again, but when. And there's been increasing publicity about the Cascadia subduction zone threat. But tonight, we want to focus on what an earthquake of this magnitude on the coast could mean to us here in Central Oregon. This is a public service program that is sponsored by the American Red Cross, St. Charles Health System, OSU Cascades, and the Bulletin. Yes. And tonight's program has been planned to allow plenty of time following the panel presentations for your questions. So this is interactive, and you're going to be part of the program. Our goal is for you to leave here tonight not frightened, but with a new appreciation of the disaster threat that we are all facing and what Central Oregon's role will be in responding to that. I would now like to introduce you to our panel. First, Dr. Scott Ashford is a Kearney Professor of Civil and Construction Engineering and Dean of the College of Engineering at Oregon State University. His research has focused on enhancing public safety and reducing potential economic loss from earthquakes and coastal hazards. His latest efforts are targeted at improving the resilience of lifeline systems in the Pacific Northwest to better withstand a major quake in the Cascadian subduction zone. Dean Ashford served for one year as chair of the Governor's Task Force on the implementation of the Oregon Resilience Plan which was charged with identifying the most important steps to take in the next biennium for Oregon to improve its resilience for the next Cascadia Subduction Zone event. And that committee's recommendations were recently submitted to the legislature. Sergeant Nathan Garraby, a former Redmond police officer, accepted the job as Deschutes County Emergency Services Manager in October of 2013. In this position, Nathan is responsible for coordinating rescue and relief efforts between government, nonprofit, and private organizations in the event of a disaster. He's also responsible for coordinating training exercises and drills between different agencies to prepare for and practice different scenarios and educating the public on what to do to increase personal preparedness. The threat of the Cascadia subduction zone and what a major earthquake on the coast could mean to Central Oregon has been a focus of Sergeant Garrity's attention. And finally, Lisa Stroop is the executive director of our local chapter of the American Red Cross. A lifelong resident of Redmond, Lisa is responsible for emergency preparedness and disaster response in 11 Central and Eastern Oregon counties and the Warm Springs Reservation. The Red Cross, led by Lisa in our region, has been making a concerted effort, including tonight's event, to inform and encourage our citizens to prepare for the coming great quake on the Cascadia subduction zone and natural disasters in general. That is our panel. We will hear from each of our panel members in their particular areas of expertise, and then the final 40 minutes or so will be dedicated to your questions for our panel members. So, with that, I would like to turn the program over to Dean Scott Ashford. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Hey, well, look, 
I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here tonight, and I'm happy to share with you um, really some of my experience uh, in my career as an earthquake engineer, uh, but also to really share with you what it means uh, if you're living in Bend, Redmond, in the Central Oregon area, uh, what it means to have this Cascadia subduction zone off our shore. And one of the things that we try to do is learn from past earthquakes uh, and try to make improvements on our resilience Right, so that, that so that it's not wasted on what we you know what the, what we've learned from these uh, from these other earthquakes from around the world. Anybody know what this picture is? It's a 1906 San Francisco earthquake, uh, where actually most of the death uh, came from the fire that followed the earthquake, because the city of San Francisco uh, lost their ability to fight fires because of liquefaction and lateral spreading broke all the pipelines, and so they couldn't hook up to the fire hydrants and put out these fires. Well, in 1989, in the Loma Prieta earthquake, also in the Bay Area, the city of San Francisco, again, lost their ability to fight fires. Liquefaction, lateral spreading, tore out all the, uh, uh, all the pipelines. And it turned out that there was just one fire uh, that started in the Marina District. They were able to bring out an antique fire boat uh, from a museum, and they had just enough uh, hose to put out that one fire. Okay, the next fire break was down in San Bruno near the San Francisco airport. Right, this was a disaster averted. Now, following that, the city put portable pump stations around uh, to, in the event that they lost their ability to fight fire, they could at least be able to uh, to to fight using these portable pump stations. Well, you know, budget budgets kind of got tight. And back in 2000, 2009, when they hadn't had an earthquake in all of 20 years, uh, you know, they decided, well, we haven't had an earthquake, let's go ahead and close down these portable pumping stations, <laughs> right? But they did it, right? We, the earthquake engineering community, a lot of community leaders uh, testified, showed, you know, explained to the city why that was really not a good idea. And so I would say that they did learn, right? And one of the things that I've learned is that learning from earthquakes is much more than just engineering, right? It's about public policy, it's about look, working with the community, and it's about working with our, our government officials so that they can make informed decisions on really the, the, what affects all of us in our day-to-day -day lives following a, an event like this. So what I'd like to do today is, is really talk a little bit about an opportunity that I had um, over the last couple of years. Um, to visit earthquakes right after, uh, within two or three weeks after the earthquake, uh, as part of the National Science Foundation team, I was able to visit uh, earthquake sites in Chile, uh, in New Zealand, and Japan. And then uh, last year, I had the opportunity to revisit those sites three years later and talk with the people that were involved in the earthquake and the rebuilding efforts and to really see what we could learn from that. And it was a fascinating experience for me and what I want to do then is kind of draw that into what it means for you here in the, in the, uh, in the Central Oregon area. The first one I'd like to talk about is Chile. Uh, here we have the Nazca plate, it's subducting underneath the South American plate. It's the fastest moving plate boundary in the world. And what that means, I mean it's geologic time, so fast is all kind of relative. But what that means though is that they have a magnitude eight and a half to nine earthquake about every 15 years. Okay? You don't have to convince the Chileans that there's an earthquake risk. You also can't find a lot of things that are still standing uh, that are vulnerable to earthquake damage. Now this is uh, a town along the coast uh, after the earthquake. Um, I think that this is what a lot of us, you know, when we think about South America and Chile, this is kind of the vision that we see, lots of adobe type structures. A quarter million people lost their homes uh, in this uh, 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake back in 2010. Um, but I want you to know that Chile is actually a very modern society. Uh, they base their building codes primarily on the, uh, uh, well, on our codes. So this building was essentially designed in the American Concrete Institute building code uh, with a few changes. Um, but this is something that we learn from and they, they are well prepared for earthquakes uh, and yet, they had significant damage and it impacted people's lives uh, severely following this earthquake. 
Um, this is in Santiago. This is three or four hundred miles away from the epicentral region. This is their main, their capital city, uh, and they lost several bridges uh, in the area, which Im impacts our mobility, right? It impacts our ability to get around and get rescue and relief supplies and repair crews out to where you need them. Now, also in Chile, and I think if you, uh, in the very beginning of my talk, I had that kind of an introductory slide, there was that bridge that had collapsed. Um, that bridge uh, cut off a town uh, from kind of the rest of Chile. We got there, it was a headline three weeks after the earthquake. And nobody had, you know, the, the government had not shown up yet to help, uh, but the community was taking care of itself. Uh, there's other bridges in the, cap in the uh, city of Concepcion along the coast. Uh, it's the second largest city in Chile, 500,000 people. All of the bridges crossing the river that led to the south of the city collapsed as a result of liquefaction and lateral spreading, completely cutting off primarily the southern part of Chile from the northern part of Chile. Right? Mobility is critical after an earthquake. Because of liquefaction and strong shaking, many communities along the coast lost their water supplies. Okay? When you lose water, that's something that people need. And people can get unruly if, you really, if there is a shortage. In this city, and this is in Concepcion, 500,000 people, uh, they had to call in the military to get control of the city. Uh, bring in water and then essentially guard the crews that were coming in to do the electrical repairs and repair the water systems um, because this was a, a city where there just wasn't water available. You also think, you got to think about your business. Uh, this is a building, actually the building was fine structurally after the earthquake, but if you look at these non-structural components, kind of the guts of the building, you know, the stuff that a business use, uses to stay in business, many of these things are destroyed in these earthquakes. So as a business, one of the things that you need to have, be able to do is have a plan on what are you going to do to stay in business immediately following an earthquake. One of the things that we saw in Chile in particular is that there's, uh, in my return three years later, that many of the small businesses went out of business, where the big shot, you know, the big kind of mega chains, uh, they were able to draw employees and resources from the rest of the country to come and stock the supplies and actually build, build, you know, there's a lot of things to sell after an earthquake. But many of these small shops that we saw that were damaged in that earthquake were completely shut down uh, three years later. And then in Chile, where you have these subduction zones along the coast, they face this double whammy of three to five minutes of strong shaking, followed by a tsunami. Okay? A tsunami, the main concern with a tsunami is saving people's lives. Right? It is going to destroy uh, what's in its path. And what you want to make sure of is that you save people's lives, and then you find a way for those communities to survive. After, after the tsunami. So following Chile in the subduction zone earthquake, I, uh, the same year I went to Christchurch, New Zealand, where there was a, uh, a swarm of earthquakes uh, in 2010, 2011. Uh, it was not a subduction zone, but I'm showing, uh, I'm, I'm including this in my, in my talk here because uh, these earthquakes devastated the city of Christchurch New Zealand, primarily as a result of strong shaking and liquefaction. Uh, and again, I had the opportunity to revisit New Zealand uh, three, uh, three years after, after these events. So liquefaction was the big deal in this earthquake. The city of Christchurch is in a low-lying area. It's very flat, uh, lots of loose sand, very high groundwater table. In fact, they had kind of an artesian condition uh, that I believe amplified the liquefaction at the site. Many parts of the town uh, settled a half a meter or a meter uh, because of liquefaction and the sand just being expelled out of the ground. 
So what that means, you get liquefaction, it's breaking pipes underneath the ground, and one of the things is, is that you lose your sewers. And so these are people living in this community, they didn't have any sewer, and so they brought in porta potties I believe from all over the nation, and they probably brought in some from Australia, and they put them outside of each one of these houses, right? Uh, and they lived like that for a long time. This is a community, uh, actually this was three years later. These houses are abandoned. Uh, about 80,000 homes were damaged in this community of 500,000. The city bought about 10,000 homes that were in an area of li li liquefaction and lateral spreading that were completely a total loss and they decided not to rebuild in those areas, right? But this, uh, this type of this sand boil where these kind of these sand volcanoes where you have the sand coming up out of the ground, it's very common, you know, in low-lying areas. Um, and it, you know, destroys a community. Uh, they also, uh, there's no, in New Zealand, there was no time limit on how long you, the insurance companies had to take to sell. Uh, and many of the companies were fully insured for full replacement value. Uh, and so the insurance companies were kind of waiting to see how long the people would hold out. Uh, my wife and I went to see a, friend's, a friend and had dinner in their home. Uh, cracks all over the house that was structurally stable. Um, they'd been living like that for about three years. And the, ins you know, the insurance company made them an offer. And they said, you know, that's really not enough. We can't rebuild this house for that amount. And they said, okay, well, we will rebuild your house but you're going to have to wait another two or three years, okay? You could, coming from Chile, where people felt, uh, actually, it was hard, three years later, it was hard to even see signs of the earthquake. In New Zealand, you could really feel this kind of pall that people were just very frustrated trying to live with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is, uh, you know, there is work going on every day in the streets of New Zealand, replacing all these, uh, actually, tens of miles worth of water lines and sewer lines. And because there's kind of long-term settlement that takes, that takes place, uh, they actually had to replace some of them a couple of times, right? And so people are trying to find a different way to work each day because the roads are blocked, because they're replacing some new lines. And there's a, I'm gonna try to use this pointer, uh, this sign right here, um, it says the businesses are open on the other side of the fence. <laughs> to be honest with you, I could, I kind of tried. I tried to find a way. I could not find a way to, to get into that little dairy mart on the corner. But you know, this is tough on a community. The Kiwis are very tough people, and they're going to make it through this. Uh, but their down, their central business district, three years later, was still cordoned off and fenced off. Uh, I mean, that's tough. And then I went to Japan, and I mean, this is the one that we all saw on TV. All right? So they had this song, Tsunami, and I really think that this earthquake in Japan and the tsunami probably did more for earthquake awareness in Oregon than any of these other earthquakes because all of us, I mean, I watch, you know, I'll get calls and emails right after an earthquake, but I'll watch TV, I'll, I'll watch the news just like anybody else. And there's a lot of information. Uh, these tsunamis are, are devastating to a community, right? In the Willamette Valley, in central Oregon, you absolutely do not have to worry about a tsunami. But our friends on the Oregon coast, this is a reality, right? And this is something that they have to prepare for. Uh, those trees that you see in the background, uh, we actually went. Those trees are still there. And those trees are really made to slow down the water. And if you're looking at tsunami mitigation, a lot of, you know, what you want to do is be able to give people time to evacuate. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of buffer zone where people aren't... Uh, you know, living right at the edge of the, you know, edge of the ocean. You want to put things in the water's way to try to slow it down because you're, you really
really want to just give people enough time to get out of there. Save their lives, we can deal with the other stuff later. Well, this is what a lot of coastal Japan looked like after the tsunami. This is three years later. Uh, this was a town, and you can see all these little concrete things. I mean, those are the wall, the little walls that they had surrounding their homes. Right? That earthquake killed uh, nearly 20,000 people, most of them from the tsunami. Uh, and, I mean, it's surreal going into an area like this and just seeing that there's nothing left. Occasionally, we'd find a home that was saved. And, you know, you wonder how, how are they doing? All their neighbors are gone, right? Now, in Japan, one of the things that they're doing is that they're trying to build consensus in all these areas on how to rebuild. Now, a challenge is that with all the infrastructure gone, uh, I'm not sure the government really has the resources to rebuild all of these small communities. But they're working with the people and they're trying to decide, okay, does it make sense to rebuild in this, in this location or should we make a different, uh, a different town where we maybe bring more people together? This is three years after the earthquake. Uh, what we hear is that it's probably going to be 10 or 20 years before they are able to rebuild. Uh, we visited some homes, kind of like apartments, uh, that, were, that was in a, a baseball stadium. And they're just kind of stacked on top of each other, and that's where the people are living. And this is for years, trying to rebuild after something. This is a tsunami debris processing facility. And there are seven of these facilities. This is just one little teeny part of it. Uh, they're processing thousands of tons of material a day. And they're pulling out all the sand. They're pulling out all the bikes. There's another pile of refrigerators. Uh, there is a pile of fishing nets, which now become hazardous waste because of all the lead, hazardous waste because of all the uh, lead that's in the fishing, in the fishing nets. Um, and they had been burning and processing this, this, this debris for uh, years. And they probably still had another year to go. Something else you have to worry about um, in a subduction zone earthquake is these plates are moving, right? And when you have this earthquake, the plates are kind of uh, coming back into equilibrium, at least for the time being. And there is often significant settlement because the plates just drop or they raise up. And you know, a lot of the evidence that we see from uh, past earthquakes, uh, we can see ge in the geologic record, we often see muscle beds. Uh, along the coast where the earth has risen up and where the mussels are now above the sea level. And all the mussels die and you see all the birds coming in and eating the mussels. Uh, and we see evidence of that over and over again in these earthquakes. In this town along the, the Japanese coast, uh, this town, the whole area settled about, subsided about three feet. And all this dirt they're bringing in because they, they have to build up the downtown area by three feet so that they can rebuild and start using the town again, right? Now, you read a lot about climate change and sea level rise and all that, you know, over the next 100 years or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. In this case, right, you had essentially 100 years of sea level, uh, of sea level rise happen overnight, okay? They were also adding three feet to all the docks in the town because all the docks were underwater. And then, got to point out these towns, these homes up in the kind of the, the little valley there, that's how high the tsunami went. And so these, this little community up there lost all their neighbors. And then you wonder how, you know, how they're getting along. Right? They probably lost a lot of their other, other services, but they're in their homes, they're sheltering in place, uh, and they are trying to build, build their lives back. Uh, this is a uh, water treatment facility outside of Tokyo, actually a couple hundred miles away from the epicentral region. 
And because of liquefaction and lateral spreading, uh, all the pipelines and the electric lines in this, in this utility tunnel, um, different sections of the utility tunnel, tunnel, some of them sunk, some of them popped up, and they anticipated there was going to be some uh, offset, and you can see there was kind of these joints here, uh, but it wasn't enough, and so this entire water treatment facility went offline, provided water for 30,000 people, this is just one small area outside the city of Tokyo. But now these 30,000 people have to find water somehow. And what you need to do is be able to bring that in, right, until you can get this thing working again. You have to bring in that water somehow. Uh, you know, by truck, put a central station where people can come and get water, right? And uh, you need your bridges so that you can get those trucks to the people that need the water. And it sure helps to have electricity and all that other stuff, right? So that you can run pumps, run lights, um, you know, run pumps so that you can uh, you can get the water maybe out of wells. If, you have, if you're on a well, you don't have electricity, you don't have water. Wow, this is uh, going the wrong direction. <laughs> So, now this is outside of Tokyo, and these are uh, vacuum trucks that they use to clean out sewer lines. So in this community, uh, there's all kinds of liquefaction that filled up all the sewer lines. So they brought in this army of trucks, and they sucked all the sand out. And I was talking with a resident in this town, and, she, and I, you know, we asked her, you know, how are you doing? And she goes, well, you know, they told me that my, I have water right now. But I don't have sewer, because my sewer line's still clogged. And if you don't have sewer, you really don't have water, right? And this was about a month, a month after the earthquake. I would say that's more of an inconvenience. Uh, this was a long way away from the epicentral region. Uh, this is up in the epicentral region. Uh, these people are waiting in line for gas, right? If you lose electricity, you lose your ability to pump, you know, to operate a gas station. And when you get electricity back, and maybe you have a generator, uh, you're able to pull gas out, and you know what I tell people now is the gas, the gas you have in your car is probably what you're going to have for a couple of weeks. In Oregon, we have uh, all of our liquid fuel comes into one energy hub up in northwest Portland, prone to liquefaction and lateral spreading, and we actually have no hope of that thing surviving the earthquake. So what that means is that if that's all of our liquid fuel, so that's diesel, gasoline, aviation fuel, that's where it all comes into the state. And so uh, I think what I've, I think that we, that we, in the state, if you look at all the gas, everything that we have, there's about a three or four day supply, right? So what that means for all of us in Oregon, in the United States, um, is that we also live on this Pacific Rim, which we call the Ring of Fire, and we have this Juan de Fuca plate subducting underneath the North American plate. It turns out that this is the slowest moving plate boundary in the world. It's moving so slow that we did not realize, as a professional community, that it was still capable of generating an earthquake. But through the geologic record and through some of these muscle beds and some uh, dead cedar trees along the Oregon coast, we were able to piece together uh, a history of actually 42 uh, magnitude 8.5 to 9 earthquakes off the Oregon coast over the last 10,000 years. The last one occurred, uh, they, we get these, you know, it kind of depends if you're on the, you know, the the north half or the south half, the whole thing goes, but on the average, they, they, uh, they, we have one about every 300 years. The last one uh, was 314 years ago. We know that because uh, it killed a tsunami killed some people in a Japanese town, and it was written up in the local newspaper, and they didn't have any idea where it came from because there was no earthquake in Japan at that time. And we were able to match that uh, with uh, some evidence on the Oregon coast of, a, of, a, of an earthquake about 300 years ago. 
So we get them about every 300 years. We haven't had one for 314. A friend of mine at Dogami says the Cascadia subduction zone is about nine months pregnant. Okay. So what does this uh, so what does this mean for us? Well. One of the things about these subduction zone earthquakes is that the geographical extent of the damage in the area affected I, is really overwhelming. So this Cascadia subduction zone stretches from Vancouver Island up in British Columbia all the way down to Northern California. And it extends offshore and in many places the subduction zone, that part of, the, of that fall that's actually going to rip uh, actually extends under land, right? So these are, this is uh, thousands of square miles. And sometimes the southern half goes and sometimes the northern half goes, but the halfway point is right off the Oregon coast. So as far as I'm concerned, it really doesn't matter which part of it goes, if the whole thing goes, we are going to be significantly affected. This is, the, uh, this is a shake map, so this kind of tells you, the, kind of the, gives you an impression of the level of shaking. Generally, as these things go, red is bad. Uh, okay, banded Redmond, you're green. I'm gonna tell you, you'll see in a few minutes, that's not really good, but it's not as bad. And you can see the Willamette Valley is kind of an orangish, which actually that's gonna be kind of bad, okay? Um, but this, is, this type of earthquake, it will be felt all over the western United States. This is a big event. Uh, the outgoing uh, head director of the National Science Foundation, um, he was asked, as he was at, you know, he said, well, what's, what's the biggest threat facing America today? You know, and they talked about climate change, they talked about terrorism, they talked about, uh, you know, a variety of things. And he said, you know, the biggest threat facing the U.S. is the Cascadia subduction zone. This is going to affect the entire country, all right? So, uh, the legislature, after the Japan earthquake and all that video on, on, you know, on, on TV, uh, they, put, they called for, the, for us to see where we are and where we need to be. And we put together this Oregon Resilience Plan. And it was a, a work of 150 volunteers. It took them over a year, and they put together a report from the business community, from the energy sector, uh, looking at critical buildings, looking at the geology, and they're looking at where we are today and where do we need to be to be resilient. And this resilience, what this is, is our ability to bounce back after an earthquake. And if you look at our lives and our communities and, our, and the economy, Right? We can't afford not to bounce back after something like this. So, I'm just going to, if you look at the Oregon coast, uh, what I'm going to do is give you some insight onto some of their lifelines or critical facilities based on what we see in this Oregon Resilience Plan and how long it's going to take them to recover about 90% of the way. So along the Oregon coast, people will be without electricity for three weeks to six months. Uh, police and fire stations will be out of commission for two, two months to sometimes over three years. Uh, fire stations tend to be less time, police stations longer. Um, when I say top priority highways to get back to partial, that's about 60% service. Uh, that's about one to three years or so. Uh, healthcare, a year and a half to three years. Water and wastewater, one to three years. This is going to devastate the coast of Oregon. And just to give you an idea of what it's going to be like there, the shaking is going to last three to five minutes. Uh, the tsunami comes in afterward uh, 15 to 20 minutes later. So people wonder about the tsunami warning along the Oregon coast. They say, if you feel the shaking, start running. Right? You've got about 15 or 20 minutes to get to high ground. Uh, and the subsidence along the Oregon coast is going to vary from two feet up to nine feet. Right? So essentially, that's a sea level rise of nine feet in some areas overnight. So if you look at the valley, things are getting a little bit better. Um, but you look at electricity. We're out of electricity for one, one to three months. How do you stay in business without power for three months? 
Okay. Uh, water, wastewater, a month to a year, depending on where you, you know, depending on where you are. Uh, healthcare facilities, the hospitals, probably 18 months. You know, when I was in Chile, we went, um, uh, you know, we visited the hospitals, and in the epicentral region, uh, many of the hospitals were put out of commission. And, you know, just a couple of the things, uh, they lost power, so they lost their, um, they lost their the elevators, so they were, weren't able to evacuate the patients on the upper floors out of the building very easily. They also lost their ability to boil water. And if you can't sterilize things at a hospital, you're, you're out of business as a hospital. So, I'm showing you these to make you feel better. <laughs> kind of, right? So, what does this mean for Central Oregon? Okay, you're not off the hook. When I said green wasn't necessarily good, uh, we will be severely affected in Central Oregon. Okay, uh, if you look at our top priority highways in their current state, it'll still take six to 12 months to get them up to back up to 60% operations. Okay, one to three years to get, get things back to normal in our current state. Typically what that is, is that you have bridges that are damaged, and when the bridge gets damaged, you have to go back in and it takes time to repair those bridges. But you also want to think about what it means for the rest of the state and the impact on you. Um, Highway 97 will become the major north-south route through the state. Uh, ODOT predicts that I-5, that only parts of I-5 will be open after this Cascadia event. So if you look at the airport, well, okay, the Redmond Airport uh, will be back in 60% operations in one to three days. Pretty much anything, e even if something is well designed for an earthquake, you gotta give them three days to get their operations back, back and, and, and running. Uh, probably three to six months to get 90% operational. But or Redmond is Oregon's primary air airport as designated by the, by the FAA. PDX will be out of commission. Okay? You are going to be very busy <laughs> here in Central Oregon. Uh, police stations and fire stations and healthcare facilities were predicting three to 30 days. Okay? That's a big deal, but you all can live with that if you're prepared, and electricity three days to three weeks, depending on where, where you're living. Water, wastewater, well this, at least you can drink water within about 24 hours, okay? You can use the bathrooms. Um, what this means is that you uh, are gonna be affected here in Central Oregon, but to be honest with you, the rest of the state is gonna be depending on you to have your act together because this is where everything is going to be staged from. Okay, and frankly there's going to be people coming from the valley uh, and this is really going to, I think, change what, how, what is going on here in Central, Central Oregon. So, in that Oregon Resilience Plan, we had, uh, there was over 140 recommendations of varying degrees of specificity. And so, I, as, um, as Dave announced, I was chair of this governor's task force for implementation of this Oregon Resilience Plan. Uh, George Endicott, Mayor of Redmond, was on the, also on my task force. And we took that big book and we went down to basically, we got down to a two-page report with recommendations in eight areas and said, okay, this is really what we need to tackle the next biennium. You know, we're not going to, this is, this is a multi-billion dollar challenge that we have. The good news is that it's going to take probably 50 years to get to where we need to be. But if we don't start, then we're never going to get there. And so what I want to do is just highlight a couple of these recommendations, uh, some of which will really directly affect, uh, affect you. Our overarching recommendation was that we need some sort of oversight, somebody in charge of resilience for the state. And so our first recommendation is that the governor appoint a resilience policy advisor. This is somebody that is reported, reports that is direct, is appointed by and reports directly to the governor's office, to the governor, right? This has been a volunteer effort. Our task force was volunteer. The uh, resilience plan was all volunteer. And it's something that we start, need to start taking seriously. The other piece is our transportation. Uh, you know, this Highway 97 being the primary north-south route in uh, in the state, it's still not ready. You saw that it was still going to be out for several months. And this backbone, not that, 
not that ODOT doesn't have a backbone, but it's this backbone transportation route or this lifeline route, which is Highway 97, but then it's Interstate 84 going over to 205, and then it's I-5 down to Highway 58, and then 58 going back over to Highway 97. That is kind of this backbone that would allow us to get emergency vehicles, rescue and relief efforts, at least around that part of the state. All the routes to the coast are, are at this point, would be closed from landslides and from bridge failure. Okay? But the work on that, uh, that, that initial backbone, uh, that's about an $800 million job. And what we're recommending is not that they pay for it the next biennium, but that we find a way to pay for it starting this plan. And then training and education, this is something that affects every single person in this audience. Uh, everything, you know, if you look at our emergency, you know, how to be prepared for an emergency, for a natural disaster, typically we recommend that you take, you, you should be prepared for three days. Okay, what we found from these earthquakes around the world is that you really need to be prepared for two weeks. Three days is just not enough, right? That means, that doesn't mean you have to have two weeks supply of water at your house, but you have to have an idea where you're gonna get it, right? Uh, if you have medi medication that you depend on, you should probably have an extra two weeks supply because there's not gonna be any pharmacies open, right, within the, within the first couple of weeks. And the main thing here is just to have a plan, right, for your family and for your community. And you'll hear more about that with the other, with the other two speakers coming up after me. We've submitted our report to the legislature. Uh, they are, they, we have senators and representatives that are going to be submitting legislation that I believe will enact many uh, of our recommendations uh, in the, uh, from our task force. And I think that's going to be a step in the right direction. I don't expect to solve all the problems in this biennium, but I believe we're going to take a step, a, a very good step in the right direction. I always like to talk a little bit about some good news, because uh, my brother was calling me Dr. Doom earlier. earlier <laughs> but people are stepping up, and I, guess, I think this is encouraging. So we, at Oregon State, we started a Cascadia Lifelines program. It's a research consortium that is fully funded by our participants. You know, it's not like we're writing a grant to the National Science Foundation, but we're getting uh, uh, our lifeline providers, right? PGE, uh, Northwest Natural Gas, Bonneville Power Administration, ODOT, uh, a variety of others have kicked in funding to jointly fund applied research to help them prepare for this Cascadia Subduction Zone event. Uh, and it is being extremely successful. We're always adding new members to it. But I believe this type of, uh, you know, this is, these are companies and agencies that have taken responsibility, right? And they have taken the right step forward to improve their resilience, to really improve the resilience uh, of the state. Uh, if you want more information, uh, you can go to the Oregon Emergency Management websites. You can download the Oregon Resilience Plan. You can download our recommendations. Uh, and also at Dogami, our, uh, they have a lot of great information about how to prepare for, for earthquakes. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your time. And I look forward later to answering questions with the rest of the panel. Thank you. So be prepared. Have a plan. Nine months pregnant. That's what I heard. Okay, up next, standing next to me, Sergeant Nathan Garapi, who is the Deschutes County Emergency Service Director. Manager. Is that above director? Or? Uh, it's a... Uh, well, you're director. It's just my title. All right. <laughs> you're, you've called me a ma uh, director and an expert. I mean, yeah, the you know, freshman's You talk to my boss about a race. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you... Uh, being here tonight, it's exciting to see the number of people in our community that are interested and engaged in a topic like this. It's really easy for people to uh, think of something that's 50 years away, potentially, and say, ah, oh, I can worry about it tomorrow. But the reality of it is it can happen right now as we're standing here talking. And so that's what you have to focus on. That's okay. I can keep talking. I'm looking for it. So uh, <laughs> I really do encourage you to read the Oregon Resiliency Plan. Uh, 
I was reading it last week, mainly because I wanted to make sure I reread it before tonight. And a friend of mine who's an emergency manager on the other side of the state, the west side of the state, called. She says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm reading the Oregon Resiliency Plan. She said, really? Why are you doing that? I said, well, because when your county's out of commission, don't you want me to at least know what's going on? <laughs> so that's a good point. Um, I'm going to talk real briefly. Uh, I think uh, the good doctor here really uh, set the stage well and, and covered a lot of what um, there is to talk about this. But, but I'm going to take it really more of a local perspective. So what does Cascadia mean for Central Oregon? And I want to tell you, I'm talking as a resident of this community, a lifelong resident, a father, a husband, my family all lives here. So I'm, this is my perspective as, as a resident, just like you. There's uh, four, really four areas I'm going to talk about specifically. Uh, obviously, goods and services, uh, how Cascadia will affect us in regards to goods and services what it means to our health care. We talked about that a little bit briefly, but I'm going to bring it kind of more centered around our St. Charles health uh, system. Uh, the potential for evacuees coming here and what our role in the response is. I'm going to try to keep it quick so we have more time for questions. Uh, frankly, you, I want to know what you want me to tell you. So. Goods and services. I think it's very likely it would be almost uh, guaranteed there's going to be some disruption in our supply chain. We talk about where our fuel comes from, but a lot of our other goods and services that we get at the grocery store uh, come from areas that will be significantly uh, impacted by this event. Fortunately, you know, a lot of our large commercial providers have distribution centers east of us, so the goal and the hope is that they can redistribute those really rapidly and, and still keep us in business for some of our critical supplies. But nevertheless, consumables will be in short supply, and then when you add the fact that Consumer panic sets in, uh, and I'm not going political here, but all you have to go back is when there was some mention of gun control, try to get ammunition, right? So, so think of that as if there's a big disaster happens, try to go to the store and find toilet paper and bottled water and canned food, right? It's all, you know, people are going to go in there and just clean off the shelves. And the really important key is Central Oregon has seen this with, with, uh, incidents of much less significance. You only have to go back to February of this year. We had a pretty significant snowstorm. By Central Oregonian standards, if you've lived here very long, it happens. We, you know, we get snow. But there were gas stations in our community that were out of fuel during that. And that was a one to two to maybe three day event, you know, depending on where you were in the county. And I'm not going to call out which gas stations it was, but think of that. So that was a, a couple day event, right? What, what happens when we have a Cascadia and we're talking weeks and months? So, clearly, this is reality. Uh, healthcare. So, if you look at the healthcare system in Oregon, most of our critical care patients, you know, we get a lot, St. Charles here in Bend is a phenomenal trauma center, but when they need help or they need to send somebody off, where do they send them? They send them to OHSU, a manual. Well, guess what? That's not going to be an option after Cascadia, at least for a while. Um, the important thing to think about is St. Charles will uh, be most likely, the St. Charles health system will most likely be the, once they get back up and running and, and ensure that their building is safe and they have the services going, they're going to be the closest functional trauma center for all the affected people in Oregon. Uh, Oregon Health Authority estimates that 65% of the hospital beds in Oregon will be offline, eliminated for a number of reasons, whether it be structural, but more likely not, A, staff can't get there. We talked about power, you know, they don't have supplies, they don't, I mean, things will break loose off the walls, and I mean, the, the, the hospitals are gonna be a shambles. And there's varying estimates of casualties, but what I can tell you is, is clearly the deaths of this event will be in the thousands, and the injuries will be in the tens of thousands. Um, it really depends, there's a lot of variables on, on, on the casualty predictions, but clearly there will be a lot of death and injury as a result of Cascadia. So I, I throw up a little map. Uh, if you look here, so here's our hospital system. Not all of these green H's are actual hospitals, but they're medical facilities. The green essentially means that they'll be serviceable. If you go over to the west, and you look like you have in Eugene, probably Riverbend, Corvallis is at uh, Good Samaritan, 
and all the way up the Willamette, Willamette Valley, down into the Rogue Valley, those hospitals are going to be tremendously affected for a long time for, from this event. So that really leaves us. So that means, one, we get an influx of patients, it, as much as they can handle. But two, for us residents, it's going to be very difficult for us to get uh, medical care. They're going to prioritize medical care significantly. Evacuees, you know, this is the real big unknown. Um, there's a lot of variables that, again, go into how many evacuees uh, we could expect, whether it be the time of year, the integrity of these traffic corridors, if, frankly, they can get across bridges and even make it here. Eventually, some of these will open up, and, they, and I would imagine that there's certainly an expectation of, of some migration. But what about the ability to evacuate? Again, if they don't have their car full of gas, and they can't get out of their neighborhood or their town or across the land of the river or wherever they are, it's going to be very difficult for them to get here. And then again, will people choose to evacuate? There's time and time again uh, examples of people saying, no, I'm going to stay. This is my home. This is where I'm going to be. If, I, if I'm going to die here, this is where it's going to be. But I think it would be irresponsible for us not to plan to some degree of, of, of evacuees showing up. You were a destination. Community, a lot of people vacation here, they have second homes here, they have friends and family here. It's, it's a logical place for people to try to come and get refuge from the storm. I mean that, uh, not literally, necessarily. <laughs> you know, we're just now, the emergency management community is just now talking, those of us in Eastern Oregon are actually, I my friend who's a Baker County emergency manager actually was over at Cease, uh, Cannon Beach. No, yeah. And they did the Race the Wave event a few weeks ago. He won it. Um, must have been that high mountain area. He was able to outrun those lowlanders. Um, but he was asked, hey, why are you here? He says, you know what? My residents vacation at the beach. And we all do. I mean, if I were to ask a show of hands, I'm sure that uh, the vast majority of people in this room have been at the coast in the last year. Now, the likelihood of this event happening while you're vacationing very low. But I guarantee you the likelihood of this event happening while somebody's vacationing at the coast is 100%. So it's important for us, even though we don't live at the coast, to recognize what to do uh, during an earthquake and a, and a result of tsunami. Um, it's not real responsible for us. I drive my wife nuts because when we go to the coast, one, um, she has to drag me there because I'm a high desert kid, you know. But uh, when we go to the coast, I get my kids, they're 9 and 10, and I say, okay. Where's the tsunami evacuation route? They have to tell me. <laughs> My wife complains that I take the fun out of everything. <laughs> so, yeah, and when you drive down the parkway, guess who's counting those cars, part, those rail cars part two? So, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of Dr. Doom. I guess I'm Sergeant Doom. <laughs> but know what to do when you're vacationing. Take the five to ten minutes to explore the route. Again, drive my wife nuts. We drive it. Like, okay, this is the road. We're going to ban the car. We're going to run. Take your 72-hour kit. That's what it's good for. Take it, have it in your car so you can run with it. So you have some basic supplies. But we have a collective responsibility in Central Oregon. One is to prepare our communities. Because one, we're going to be affected. And we don't uh, have the resources to take care of everything. I'm sorry, that's just the reality. What? Stop. I guess I'm done. No. I can, uh... yeah, so here we go. Uh, so we're, we need to prepare for but we also need to prepare to shelter your friends and family. So if you anticipate that you might have friends or family show up after this event, and you figure that two weeks of supply for your family, well, you better double it if you're taking another family in, right? Uh, so think about that. Think of how you can support those that might show up in our community that need help. We increase community resiliency equals less burden on the system. If we are prepared, if our infrastructure is safe and sound, and we've mitigated the hazards here locally, it decreases the burden we put on the, the, the bigger picture and allows these services and those resources to really go to those people that absolutely need it. Um, we're, we need to be there to help these people. I mean, this is a humanitarian event of epic proportion. I mean, this will likely, I've been told, and again, I'm not the expert, but I've been told it will, you know, Katrina will pale in comparison. We're talking 10 million people affected by this event. 
mean, that's a tremendous amount of people. So, again, we talked about the airport. Yes, Reagan Airport is, FEMA has come in and stamped their, put their flag and said the Reagan Airport is the primary incident support base for all the logistical support for this event. So, you think Highway 97 is busy now, wait till this event, right? It'll make you even more frustrated driving through the pandemic. But there's a lot of other facilities in Central Oregon that are going to be put into play. I would venture to say that if it's a government building, a school, a church, a fairground, a city park for that matter, it's likely to be pressed into service for something, whether it's staging equipment, uh, housing uh, relief workers, housing, sheltering those people that show up and need help, somehow it will be in play. So a lot of what we see day to business as usual will not be occurring even after we get our power back and, and we kind of think that we're, we're back to normal. And that will go on for months or years. Again, a massive influx of relief workers to all of Central Oregon. And so we're all in it. Again, humanitarian uh, event of epic proportions. You know, the thing about it is that history has shown, if you look at similar events around uh, the world, that this relief effort sometimes absolutely overwhelms the local population. Or the, you know, we'll be relatively intact structurally, but, you know, we're going to have all these people show up. You know, we're going to try to provide service, some degree of service to these people. And that's where these relationships between government, nonprofit organizations, and our non governmentals, and our private citizens, our churches, that's where these relationships really are critical in, in surviving this event. And not only surviving it, but, but again, rebounding from it. So let's talk real briefly about government. Yes, this is how I view myself. Right. So. Yeah, was it Bonnie Tyler saying, I need a hero? <laughs> so yeah, you know, we're rolling in on our white horse, you know, with that song playing in our heads in the background, and we're saving the day, right? Well, the reality of it is I hate to admit it, but maybe not, probably not, okay? There's only so much to go around. And so, again, this is back to that key message of preparedness. But we are doing a lot. We're focusing on our community resiliency, not only here locally, but we're working with our partners and our stakeholders across the state to improve what, how, improve the systems to not only to mitigate these risks ahead of time the best we can, but to then plan and, and to prepare a response that is sensible, logical, and will do the most good for the most people. Again, plan for this response. You know, we're we're all collaborating on on, on kind of a playbook of sorts. You know, what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, how it's going to be done, and, and really so that when that event happens at 1 o'clock in the morning, and some sleepy-eyed, you know, person at the OEM watch center wakes, you know, wakes themselves up, that they, they have a plan to immediately kick off. We're, again, we're, if we're making sure our infrastructure is in, in place. Deschutes County is just now embarking on our update, our natural hazard mitigation plan. One of the things we want to talk about is how these natural hazards impact this critical infrastructure community ensure that it is as survivable as possible. <coughs> Continuity of operations planning. It's important for governments, especially relief agencies, businesses too. Uh, Red Cross has a great program. I'm sure they'll pitch it um, for, I don't pitch. Maybe that's not the term <laughs> I knew at some point I was going to say something. I forget. No. But it, again, it's a good, important program. But, you know, how are you going to survive this event? How are you going to survive without personnel showing up? Because remember, people are family members first, and they have to take care of their homes, they have to take care of their family members. We have to plan for that. And then identifying these core critical services that must be provided. That's really important, right? If, if a bad day happens and we can only do three things, we better figure out which three things are most important. And then we're going to do the best job we can on those three things, and we're going to save lives and do the best we can for those people. What can Central Oregon residents do? Well, I'll give you a picture of a Boy Scout. I think that's really all I need to say, right? Be prepared. That's the Boy Scout motto. I think that is the, the message of the night. You've got to prepare yourself. Oh, there we go again. <laughs> Boy, this is sticky stuff here. Uh, anyway, prepare yourselves. Plan for this shortage of health. There's not going to be enough of us to go around. But more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, as important, encourage your friends and family. Bug them. Uh, you know, get your kids a Christmas present they'll hate. <laughs> yeah. 
get them a tick, right? Get them thinking about it. Make them, you know, really encourage the encourage your friends and family. You almost have to become like missionaries of preparedness. Go around, you know, knock on doors, not that. But you know, you've got to take care of, of your friends and family. Encourage them to take care of themselves and remind them that there may not be somebody to take care of them other than themselves or their neighbors or their family. If you look at major disasters, 95% of the care and rescue that is going on in the immediate after effects of a disaster are by other citizens. That's tremendous. And most importantly, start now. So I'm going to leave you with one question before I turn it over to uh, Lisa. Is how long can you survive without power, fuel, a grocery store that actually, you know, I mean, it'll be there, but, you know, if there's anything in it, you can buy anything, or a pharmacy. So ask yourself, I hope you think of that on your way home tonight, and just ponder that question and start the plan now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Director of the American Red Cross. Round of applause for Lisa Stroop, please. steps back and we start to get prepared, okay? Um, I want to take you, I want you guys to go to pre pretend land with me for just a little bit, okay? Um, I want you to pretend that what Nathan just told us happened. It happened right now. It's happening to us. And uh, you may not be in this theater. Think about, uh, maybe you are at the coast vacationing. Maybe um, you went to a ball game in Portland or Seattle. Uh, maybe you're on the East Coast vacationing, but now you're, you got to think about who's here left behind. So, well, I'm, I'm going to give you some more bad news real quick before we go further into pretend land. Uh, there is going to be a test tonight. You do have to pass with 100% or I won't leave the stage. Dave, Dave said we have to leave the stage on time or something bad happens, and uh, we don't want that to happen. So, but the good news is I'm going to give you the answers right now, and unless you've had too much wine, you should be able to remember them this wine. Mother. <laughs> so the answers are as follows. Be informed, make a plan, and build a kit. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit. Can you guys remember that? All right, now we're back to pretend land, and we're in the middle of this chaotic event. I want you to think about the first component, be informed. I want you, after I ask the question, to stand if you feel very confident that you have enough tools and resources with you or at your home that you're going to be able to stay informed during this, these time periods that Dr. Ashford and Nathan told us about. Stand if you feel like you're going to be, have enough tools to stay informed. You need to know where you're at, where you should be, where you can get help, all those kinds of things. touched on the most important part of the plan, and that is, are we going to be able to find our loved ones? When we can't find the people we care about, we panic, and when we panic, we make really bad decisions. Part of your plan should be that within a certain time period, you all can find each other. And if you look at some of the things they talked about without power and phone service, you're going to have to get a little creative. So I want you to stay standing or stand if you feel real confident that in the next three or four hours, you are going to be able to find out who in your circle of loved ones is safe and well and where they're at. Yeah. 
lights. <laughs> All right. Component number three was build a kit. Again, everybody's kit looks different. I get to train preparedness all over the state. Um, was up in a county headed towards Eastern Oregon the other day. Saw some kits that folks build. Um, they had a lot of liquor and guns and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've seen people's kits that are full of baseball bats and mitts and, and balls. I think they think the disaster time is vacation. You, you just don't know what you're going to see in a kit. Everybody's kit's a little different. But, um, you know, there's one thing that we all have to have. Um, me, and maybe a few of you in here, I could go without a few meals. I could make it without food for a little bit. But I can't go without water. The formula for water is one gallon per person per day. So I want you to think about what uh, Dr. Ashford and Nathan said about the two to three week thing. Stay standing or stand if you feel like you have enough water just to save your family. <laughs> Bob just reminded me about something else that was actually kind of funny. A lot of times you see people's kids and they're really focused on their pets. Really. I don't know if they plan on <laughs> sharing supplies. Okay. I feel a little bit bad. I thought there'd be more people standing at the end of this exercise. I mean, because we're Central Oregonians, we're supposed to be super tough and smart. <laughs> no, don't, don't you dare sit down. <laughs> I feel bad because uh, I feel like I put a target on your back a little bit. Um, you s people that are still in your chairs, you might want to look at these people that are standing. <laughs> Get to know them a little bit. Figure out where they live. That kind of thing. <laughs> All right, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Stretch your legs a little bit. Amy, are you close by with our little prizes? I want you to, there's three of you in this room. When your seat flips up, there's a little piece of clear tape on it with some X's on it. And... Got the tape, stay standing. If you don't, sit down. <laughs> so, Karen, so we've got one here. You have, you now can be informed. You have an emergency radio that's solar powered, crank powered. We got one in the balcony, I know for sure. And there's probably somebody here in the back somewhere. <laughs> Karen, do you remember what seat numbers they were? Okay. Okay. Um, I raised three kids, and I, you know, you're, you're trying to teach your kids things. I was told there's lots of good ways to learn, and um, one of my favorites is to watch somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. And so I'd like to share this quick video with you. Uh, this looked a lot like my house when we started getting prepared for disaster. That was some storm. Yeah. Hey, good thing I packed an emergency kit. Let's see, we got some chocolate frosting, okay. soy sauce, pancake mix, wow. shoehorn, bag of glass. There's Nancy. Can you, oh. Can you do have a first aid kit here? Gummy worms? Yeah, that's for cars. Oh! Careful with those, those are level four. This dream is still alive, baby. Oh, some nuts. Some protein, that's smart. <laughs> this is the stupidest disaster kit I've ever seen. What are you talking about? Did you bring a kit? I did you make one? Because I did my best. No, but I did download some apps from the American Red Cross. Okay, it says here we should have important phone numbers memorized, that we should pick a place to meet in case we get separated, and that we should really keep supplies in the trunk of our car. Hey, I've got stuff in my trunk. Peat moss? Okay. Okay. That's grandma. <laughs> Better plan. Putting together an 
emergency kit with a three-day supply of useful items is easy and doesn't take much time at all. For a full list of what to include in your kit, tips on how to put together a plan, and links to download our preparedness apps, visit redcross.org slash prepare. actually won't take you much time, you just got to care about it. You've got to care about building a culture of preparedness. So what does a culture of preparedness look like? I want you to think about, um, think back when you were a kid, how many in this room, when their folks, uh, somebody slammed on the car brakes, the only thing that kept you going through the windshield was your mom and dad's arm. <laughs> okay? It would be unheard of for hardly any of us in this room to go outside tonight and go home and not be shoulder belted, lap belted, and surrounded in airbags. So look what we did as a society for a culture of auto safety. How many of you, when you were a kid, the smoke alarm was the first person that woke up and smelled the smoke? Okay, look what we've done for a culture of and fire safety. And we can do that with preparedness too. It should be unheard of that we send our kid over the pass to college in the middle of winter and they don't have that go kit in their trunk. It should be unheard of that you go to somebody's house and they don't have a closet full of water. Okay? It's a culture of preparedness. And um, I love teaching it. A lot of things that people don't know about our local Red Cross is that we're really, well, we're rock stars at teaching preparedness. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. We are. Um, we have some great programs that we go out and teach for free. We love to do it. We have four. We, for everything from teaching little tykes, clear up to teenagers, senior citizens, dealing with things like medicines and oxygen and things that you've got to really consider in those kind of situations. And we have a special program for businesses and organizations. So they're not going to let me stand up here on mic because you're going to do something mean to me in a minute, aren't you? Yeah. This is what I am going to send you home with. Um, I told you about the three components and I want you to work on those this week. Not next week, and not the week after. And you're gonna leave the lobby tonight, you're gonna find a whole stack of these, I brought hundreds of them with me. They look like great fire starter, and they are, but don't start a fire with them. You're gonna read these, every time I open it up, I find something else in there. It is full of great information about making a plan, being informed, and building a kit, okay? Take one for yourself, take some for your kids, take some for your neighbors, all right? When you get done reading it, if you're still confused, call your local Red Cross office. We'll come to your church, we'll come to your neighborhood, we'll come to your homeowners association. Uh, we work for free, and I'm not, you know, we like to work for cookies, but we will work for free if we have to. Um, okay, test. Everybody has to pass 100%. Jonah's got the spotlight, we will be spotlighting, so if you feel the light go over your face, it's because we're checking your lips. Okay. All right. The three components of getting prepared are be, Before. make, Before. and build. spoken to grab the chairs, come, come to the center because it's almost time for our Q&A, but I'd also like to introduce Redmond Mayor George Endicott as a mayor of a Central Oregon City that will likely play a very important uh, supporting role. Redmond yeah. 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 will play a, 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 an important role in uh, responding to the Cascadia subduction zone disaster. George has been intimately involved in the response planning and preparation, and uh, we want him to be a part of our Q&A. So, um, oh, you brought, you, brought, uh, you brought a plan. George, this is your mic, you get a special mic. And so, pull up a chair, and, and uh, we don't have mics for the audience, but the acoustics in the tower computer is so great that we, if you have questions, please raise your hand, I'll call on you. We just ask you to project so we can hear your question if it's work for one of the uh, specific panel members or in general? Okay, right there, your question. Is the Nancy Cleary projects along 97 related to the, uh, the plan for 97 to be a main thoroughfare? The massive clearing along Highway 97. Yeah. Who can speak to that? Not really my wheelhouse, 
but um, I believe that has more to do with the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation's uh, overall plan. I know that they've uh, thinned a lot uh, to provide uh, solar uh, heating of the roadway to help prevent some of the icy spots that they've done that over the years, and also uh, they've, they've done some fuels management within the the right of ways of the state highway. So I would suspect that that's the, uh, the main reason. Okay, question right here. So I have a Red Cross app that shows me earthquakes and notice that there was a 3.0 off of Walford yesterday. Is that any indication of what might happen in the future? Yeah, there'll probably be one tomorrow. Also a 3.0. So, you know, anytime, uh, the small earthquakes, we have those all the time, and often, uh, they'll, if it's a slow news day, they'll make, they'll make some note that there's a magnitude two or three earthquake. Um, when we have these giant earthquakes, they're, they're so large that those little earthquakes really don't relieve much of the stress. Um, occasionally, there'll be like a, a seven that might be a foreshock. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know enough about the earthquakes yet to, to know if it is the foreshock. And then afterward, there are thousands of aftershocks. Um, and a lot of times, the aftershocks, you know, along a, a subduction zone event, are still magnitude six, seven, and eight, all real earthquakes on their own. Uh, and then you worry about your, your rebuilding efforts and stuff, things that have been damaged in a main earthquake can get further damaged in, in liquefaction reactivation and aftershocks. Okay, back in the corner here. <coughs> if they have a nine earthquake on the coast, will we feel it here? <coughs> Absolutely. You will feel it here and, and it will cause damage uh, here. Um, it'll, you'll feel it. It's, uh, uh, it. You won't feel it as strongly as they do on the coast. But it's going to be strong enough that it'll cause damage. I think one one thing in that regard, if you, uh, I have in here the Oregon Resilience Plan. If you if you have insomnia or you don't want um, nightmares, don't read it. But uh, if you look in there, the the model is kind of a nine on the coast, a seven in the valley, and a five over here. So we will still shake pretty good. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that. So there's a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the towns will survive. They'll be strong shaking. You know, typically what you look at are, um, for buildings, it's older buildings that have more trouble uh, as compared to the newer buildings that are designed to um, more up-to-date seismic codes. Uh, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that this Cascadia subduction zone, you know, we did not, you know, know that it was capable of an earthquake until really the 1980s. So if you think of anything built before the 1980s, including most of our bridges and much of the water systems and sewer systems and you know, these legacy power stations that were built you know, 50, 60 years ago, none of that was designed for this type of earthquake. And so it's the older stuff that really is going to be you know, having the most trouble. Yes, sir. You spoke to the 684 earthquakes in California. <coughs> So if you have, uh, let's say if you have a magnitude 6.8 earthquake, uh, the amount of energy released, uh, the amount of energy released between a 6.8 and a 9 is about a thousand times. And so, you know, if you look at the Loma Prieta earthquake in the Bay Area in 1989, that lasted about 15 seconds. Uh, it caused a significant amount of damage. It ended up having part of the Bay Bridge collapse, you know, 80 miles away from the epicenter. Uh, if you look at a, a subduction zone earthquake, um, they last three to five minutes, and the amount of, you know, the shaking is, the, 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 the rupture surface, you know, that fall uh, is going to extend, in this case, you know, from Northern California to Vancouver, you know, to British Columbia. So a thousand miles long, and it's a couple hundred miles wide. 
and it'll be felt over a huge area. Um, and it'll cause that type of damage, but it's going to be causing that type of damage over a very broad area. Yes, sir. Because we have a pipeline coming through Central Oregon. Uh, yeah, the, I mean the gas, the natural gas, uh, doesn't you know it'll stay you know it stays in the pipe unless the pipe is ruptured. I believe from the Oregon Resilience Plan, what I saw is the natural gas actually is uh, in Central Oregon is pretty well prepared, and I believe that they would be back up and running pretty quickly. What about our water? Uh, also in water in central in central Oregon, the resilience plan shows that within 24 hours, uh, water and wastewater facilities would still be up. No, no, I can address that at least a little bit. Certainly in, in Redmond, we've been preparing for this now, um, and I don't know. I have been trying to talk to the other mayors from around uh, all the communities here in central Oregon, but we we now have plans. All of our all of our water comes from pumps. The Bend is fortunate enough to also have some gravity. But um, all of our wells have, have backed up uh, generators. We can go for about a week without power being restored, which uh, Bonneville says we will get. Also, all of our wastewater uh, is also taken care of with, with pumps uh, or gravity. So in our case, we have water, and we don't think there will be a disruption in Redmond, but each community you have to ask your own water department because it is very localized. Remember, your water departments are owned by the cities or, or a private company. They are not, or your own well. If you live in, out of the city and you have your own well and you don't have a generator and you lose power, you're not going to have water until you get power restored. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, I think on the, regarding the natural gas, the Cascade Natural Gas and TransCanada, I've talked to them about it. They're, they're confident in their pipeline's ability to survive this event. The one thing you do should consider, though, is what your home, what the connection in your home is like. Is your hot water heater, if you have a gas hot water heater, how is that strapped? Is it is it secure so it doesn't fall off the stand or, or um, potentially damage some connections within your home? I think there's a good, there's a, definitely a lot of information uh, on the web and a lot of uh, publications out there to talk about how you can uh, help your home be more uh, <coughs> Disaster proof, so to speak. And I think that natural gas is probably one of those important ones, so you can prevent that fire situation. Yes, Paul. Uh, in the event of an eight or nine point quake on the coast, uh, what's the current scientific thinking about the threat of uh, initiating some kind of volcanic event, such as on the South Sister? Yeah, the, uh, so for the, we have this subduction zone off the coast, and that's kind of one of the reasons why we have this string of volcanoes here. Uh, so in geologic time, what happens is that when the, the subduction zone, you know, when there's a big earthquake, and there's that plate movement, and one of the plates slips further down, you know, underneath the other one, uh, then there is... Uh, that also has a tendency to reactivate some of the volcanoes along the, along the range. <laughs> yes. So that is, I mean, that is a, a hazard addressed in our, our natural hazard mitigation plan. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the volcanoes that are being watched by the, uh, the Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, we have a couple of the ones they watch very closely, one, the, the Three Sisters and Newberry Bowl, and uh, they're watching really very carefully. So, you know, the disaster resiliency, it, you can pick your disaster, but the point is, is to be resilient to build your infrastructure, build your community and that cultural preparedness so that you can survive and rebound from whatever that fill in the blank is. What's gonna happen to cell service and data services? I don't see that mentioned. So the, uh, a lot of the cell phone towers have about a three hour battery. 
in them. And so in a lot of you know, earthquakes, when you lose power, uh, then they have cell service for about three hours. Uh, there's some that have six hour, hour batteries, and what you want to do is be able to get power back to those so that they, they work. Uh, something else is that often when the, the, the system is disrupted, uh, they go down instead of the generation, you know, you know, third or fourth generation cell phones, they go back to second generation. And so at, in, after an earthquake, a lot of times texting uh, is much more, is much easier way and has a much better chance of getting through than trying to make a, make a call. So often we'll, we'll be using texts uh, to try to communicate with each other. One other thing to say, if, if you talk to almost any organization or community that's been through a natural disaster, the heroes in terms of communication are the ham operators. Because they're there, they have battery powered systems. And if you go talk to the folks over in Katrina, for example, it was the ham operators that, that really were the communicators. And, and we have ham radios in all our emergency response centers here. Yeah, we said more. We build our, uh, and we're trying to get away from the amateur because these guys are far from amateur, a lot smarter than most of us. So, um, but auxiliary communication, we, we build that into our plan. So uh, our emergency operations center has that ability. We can communicate with the hospital, we can communicate with Redmond, uh, the Pine, and, and we're trying to really build up that network with the community to be able to provide that fun communication. Okay, right here. What would happen to our local Sure. Um, what about the, the dam, safety of dams and how far up to Columbia would a tsunami uh, uh, affect the area? I'll talk about the dams, uh, at least locally. That's really um, still being assessed. Uh, most of those are uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, dams, and they're right now in process of evaluating dam safety as it relates to not only seismic, but just in general. Uh, and then I don't I can't answer the tsunami so the, Columbia question. So. Yeah, so uh, the tsunami would um, come up to Columbia, and there's evidence in these other types of, you know, uh, uh, subductions and earthquakes where the tsunami will come up several miles inland. Uh, the Columbia is a very big river, and it's anticipated tsunami would go up. Uh, noticeably, several miles, it's likely that we could measure it, even in Portland. But to measure a tsunami, you can actually measure the change. You can measure the tsunami, uh, a very, very, very small tsunami in our instruments. Really, it wouldn't necessarily cause any damage, but there's studies going on right now to see how far up it would really have an impact. Yes, sir. So you're, you're probably referring to CERT teams, community emergency response teams. Right. Oh. Neighborhood, neighborhood emergency teams, teams are they being formed? The neighborhood emergency response teams that are there supposed to be initial response before when the police and firemen are busy doing other things. The neighborhood <laughs> emergency response teams uh, are they being formed to give first responder before police and fire can get there? We're in the uh, embryonic stage of getting those uh, developed. Uh, historically, there hasn't been a lot of uh, uh, interest in Central Oregon. Uh, I think one due to kind of some of the culture and the fact that you know outside of you know cities of Bend and Redmond were fairly rural. So, uh, but there is a place. As a matter of fact, I've had conversations in the last uh, month regarding what it would take to stand those up and, and uh, identify funding to to look at that and then see if there's organizations, existing organizations out there that would sponsor those because they really are a localized uh, team that, that you're right, it's kind of a trained layperson. Uh, there's uh, I think there's about 40 hours of training, 30 to 40 hours of training involved in becoming certified as a CERT team member uh, and 
And so there is a process involved. There's some, some funding to get. We don't have any, we don't have a real good mechanism in place here currently, but that is, uh, again, like we're in that, that real early stages of doing that. One of the things that um, has happened in Redmond, and it was organic, it's actually pretty interesting, <coughs> the uh, Redmond Ministerial Association, which is, um, well, I think 30 or 40 churches in, in Redmond have all gotten together and put together an emergency response plan for how they would support uh, the community in the event of, of a major disaster. Oh, up in the back there. With cell phone use and electricity out, are there suggestions about how to make a plan to communicate with relatives in the valley in Portland on the coast? All right, the question is with cell phone and electricity out, is there a plan on how to communicate from here <coughs> to family or friends outside the area? I think kind of the standard is to identify a central contact person to check in with outside of the area. So if you have family in Idaho or uh, you know New York for that matter, that everybody checks in with that person uh, you know when you can, when you have some sort of, sort of communication to do so. That's kind of the uh, the standard for for that kind of widespread communication checking when you don't have good communication. Have no relatives out of the area. So, if, so you don't have relatives outside the area. Um, yeah, that's the tough one. You know, I think uh, Red Cross has an app that you can utilize. The area area. Red Cross has an app called Save and Well. You can use that as well. You can pre-log into it before something happens, and then when something does happen, and it a lot of times will work because you can still use that bandwidth and get some texting. The the other of having an out of the area contact, have an in the area contact because every summer we have wildfires and there's going to be situations with your neighborhood where you're going to use your in the area contact. Out of the area contact, um, a lot of times um, landlines won't, they won't be having, they'll shut down inbound service but you'll be able to get outbound service. So if you can get somewhere where there is a landline, you can get that message to your out of state contact person where you may not be able to call the person next door. Right here. Have you considered um, flooding caused by rimrock blocking the canyon? Have you considered flooding caused by <coughs> rimrock blocking the canyon? If we're going to shape for a five point, there's a lot of people that are living below rimrock. So what's the likelihood that the crooked river, for instance, is going to be backing up in the canyon? The question is, what's the likelihood that something like the Crooked River could back up in the canyons where there are homes? You know, that's going to be specific to the uh, geology of that specific canyon and, and what degree of shaking would be expected. And again, that's, uh, I put that on my list to evaluate where our natural habitat is. We actually kick that off next week. So, um, But I, we do consider flooding in Central Oregon from a number of causes. For example, Bend is subject to flooding in downtown due to ice dam flooding similar uh, uh, mechanism, so to speak. So we do consider flooding in our overall uh, emergency operation plan and our, and our hazard uh, identification. Right here. I'm concerned about uh, saving water. Uh, you know, these plastic containers, the two-gallon or gallon or whatever, I mean, they're not designed to save for years, you know, and then they're not to be over a uh, Okay, what's the best way to have safe bottled water as there's part a, of your kit? There's a, there's, a, there's a few different things you can use. What The one thing you were talking about, the bottles that have the, the special <coughs> filters, yeah. are a good thing to have because you might be somewhere and need to just get some water and make sure it's clean. A lot of folks with their water, um, if they want to get on the internet, you can learn the recipe for using a little bleach and using that system. Sometimes that's too cumbersome for people, and you can simply get your plastic water bottles and have a rotation system so that it doesn't sit there forever and ever. And a lot of people do that with their food storage too. They'll, they'll have that storage and it doesn't just sit there and grow mold. You, you 
rotate it through, eat it, and use it, but just always keep that one stop steady. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> In the flat shirt in the corner. Earthquake resilience of the larger dams on the Columbia. Um, actually, I asked that question. Um, <coughs> last year we had the FEMA log logistics director for Region 10 out of Seattle and Redmond at the airport because of this issue. And I asked that question, and he's been working with the uh, Bonneville Power Administration. They expect <laughs> no real impact on the dams from the earthquake, but they have to shut all of the turbines down and inspect them before they can spin them back up. And even though we're on the main transmission lines coming out of out of uh, the Columbia, we will still be down a minimum of three days for power here, and we'll be the first to get power restored. So keep that in mind. It could be anywhere from three days to two weeks, depending on where you are on the grid, even here in Central Oregon. Okay, in the balcony here. Hi, um, I was wondering just locally um, with a lot of the healthcare workers and first responders um, if, if the plan is more that everybody will be kept here or if they will be the plan is to send them out to, for response. And then also just kind of on the federal level because obviously we can see what's going on in the state and the local communities, how big of a priority is this in the federal level? Okay, question is uh, local health providers, <laughs> medical personnel, Will they be sent outside the area to help people over in the valley? And then the other question, how much federal help would we be seeing? Well, right now, no. How much of a priority, how much of it is, you know, is it on the radar? You know, okay. I'm hearing FEMA and they're declaring right. the Redmond Airport. So how much of a federal priority is the, you know. Right. And, and how large a federal priority would this disaster be? So to answer your first question, uh, more likely than not, the vast majority of our healthcare workers stay right here, stay put. Okay. This is where they're as far as first responders, you know, there's a lot of uh, responders that could potentially lend aid uh, to the, the more uh, stricken areas. However, you know, we have an obligation to ensure that we can take care of our hometowns first, and that's what we will do. Uh, but there are mutual aid agreements. Uh, there's agreements statewide that allow for us, once we can ensure that we have services provided here, that we can provide adequate level service. We could potentially send some responders to help. I think. Uh, it's very likely that that could occur, but it's really going to be dependent upon if we're able to take care of our, our needs here in the home population. As far as uh, whether it's on the federal radar, it's absolutely on the radar at the federal level. It's uh, you know, probably, I can't, it changes day to day, but it's in the top few priorities. As far as FEMA Region 10 is concerned, I think it's their number one priority for, uh, it is, it is the most likely and the most significant cataclysmic event that could happen in this part of the country and probably the country as a whole. So it is very much on FEMA and the federal government's radar. Okay. Thank you. Okay, blue shirt in the back. paraphrase, with all the infrastructure damage that will happen uh, around the state, who makes the decisions on how to prioritize how those, the, 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 those damaged areas are, are fixed or, or prioritized? So I would, I would uh, probably refer you to the, what's called the National Response Framework. Basically, it essentially lays out a, an incident management uh, system in place. So uh, this would be a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, they had multiple, uh, what is referred, and I hate to use the lingo, but what's called Type 1 incident management teams deployed in, at Hurricane Katrina, it would be a similar event here. Uh, through that incident management organization, they would prioritize and uh, prioritize where resources are going. And there's also another layer above that where you have elected officials and, and those uh, folks that would then make some of those policy decisions regarding what services are most important, where the uh, 
contested resources go. And I'll give you an example. It happens every year during fire season. So throughout, uh, you know, typically the western United States is all burning at the same time, and we have what's called national resources like air tankers and things like hot shot crews. So there's high level, uh, it's called a MAC organization that, that determines and prioritizes events and, and where these resources go. It would be a very similar event to that, just on a monumental scale. Great. Uh, back in the corner, white shirt. Yeah, this is for Dr. Asher. If you can just briefly define liquefaction and the lack of break, and what kind of impact that might have in sport and or even in your event. Great. So, yeah, so uh, the question was to define liquefaction and lateral spread, and so, uh, and then what would be the impact of Portland or here? So, uh, liquefaction is a phenomenon where you have loose, uh, sandy deposits that are saturated, and during the uh, during the earthquake, uh, the all the sand particles try to densify. You know, they try to get closer together, and what ends up happening is that they squeeze the water that's in between the sand grains, and it squeezes water so much that it actually uh, raises that pressure and it lifts the sand grains off of one another. And when that happens, it loses uh, most of its strength. So what we see, and so what we see as a result of liquefaction, we often see uh, uh, buildings will tip over uh, or settle, uh, and then when they lose their strength, this lateral spreading is associated with liquefaction. So when the ground loses its strength, you'll get, you can get landslides in, on very, very shallow slopes. And so you'd often see those along rivers, uh, like the Columbia or the Willamette. Uh, it's anticipated in the Portland area and along the Willamette Valley and along the coast and low-lying areas that there would be significant liquefaction. Uh, as you come over to central Oregon, the shaking is going to be less. Uh, but there are areas, uh, you know, where you have sandy soils with the high groundwater uh, that would be susceptible to them. Go ahead. Uh, what would the uh, military's involvement? What is the military's involvement? Yeah. So the uh, military is involved heavily in the planning, uh, and really will be a phenomenal asset especially as it relates to transportation of items. I mean, we have a significant airlift capability through the Air Force and National Guard and Air Guard. So they would most definitely be put into play for that. Uh, the, the governor could mobilize the National Guard to assist with uh, security at, at high risk for, uh, for uh, critical infrastructure to ensure that uh, uh, those sites are secure. The military really is uh, very similar to what you see in a, in a relief effort, is a lot of bodies, a lot of trucks, a lot of aircraft, and that those big ticket items that we need to really get relief and support to the community as, as soon as possible. Uh, each, each military organization, the military has predefined roles as far as like what the Coast Guard is going to be doing, what the Navy would be doing, what the Air Force would be doing. Uh, they're all working that, that's part of that playbook uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier. Yes. If people locally are forced to go to shelters, will they be allowed to take their pets with them? So service pets are allowed in the shelter. And, um, you know, we ran a shelter in Mavericks all this last weekend for that hotel fire, so we deal with this kind of thing all the time. We have a great pet evacuation team that operates here in Central Oregon, and I think that's a pretty standard service um, across the area. So they're you won't be able to bring your pets into the shelter unless it's a service animal, but they will have accommodations for your pets. Yes? Um, we know from, just from the news today, even, you know, they're still fighting the wars over who got the ball with Sandy, and, and you're still hearing about the people who got the ball with the Japanese earthquake and so on. It becomes clear to me that, that we need to be able to take care of ourselves and our neighborhood. Great question. Uh, is there a resource to find out uh, how structurally sound the, your residence is or the ground where you live? Good 
uh, the, the, the ground, I'm not sure. The building itself, of course, your building department. And as you heard, it's very dependent on when it was built. Uh, the other thing we know about these long wave earthquakes, which this one would be, is that wooden and steel frame structures hold up a lot better than masonry structures. So I don't know what kind you live in, but see what your comfort level is. As far as the ground, you know, here at Central Oregon, at least almost all of it is rock, not very far down. So you're probably pretty good shape there. There are uh, uh, Dogami, this, uh, our Department of Oregon uh, Geology and Mineral Industries. They do have uh, maps online for many areas that talk about different geologic hazards, including liquefaction and landslides. Um, and it depends just if they've completed a map for your area. And that, that does exist uh, in Sheepskin. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know the currency of it, but uh, I think it's called HasView. Uh, if you go to Dogami's website, um, for the most part, we have really good soil, and but there are areas that potentially kind of meet that threshold for liquefaction, so to speak, if the shaking is, is enough. Uh, Southern Deschutes County and Lapine area, uh, you know, where you see that high water table and sandy soil is, is an example. So, um, but again, it's kind of that what kind of building you're in, what kind of soil you're in. Yes. Yep. You. Uh, I read a little bit about this, and the geologists, as of a few years ago, were a little bit unsettled with regards to the mathematical odds over the next 10 or 100 years of this nine occurring. Have, have they kind of gotten together and come up with those odds, or is that still that out there? The question is, uh, there was confusion a few years back with the uh, geologists with when the nine uh, would occur, and is there more consensus now I, I think there's more consensus. So if you look back, uh, if you go from back in the 1980s, we didn't think it would occur. And then initially when we started hearing about it, we started hearing these recurrence intervals of 1,500 years, and then it became a... No, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's, there's a, uh, uh, you know, 500 years. So now what we... We have much more information because we have record of, of 42 of these earthquakes. And so what we find is that there's, uh, in the southern half of the fault, come ruptures more often on the average about every 240 years. Uh, the northern half ruptures less frequency, frequently, and the whole thing ruptures even less frequently. Uh, but on the average, uh, we're looking at something around 300, every 300 years. I've been told there's a question in the balcony. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, will Central Oregon feel the quake at the same time as the Oregon coast or later? It will be later. So uh, the earthquake waves will be generated along that fault rupture surface and then they will travel uh, through the, the bedrock and the waves will travel through the bedrock and they'll kind of spread out and hit the ground surface. And so you, you would actually be able to be, if you were talking to one of your friends on the coast, uh, they, you would, they might say, hey, I feel an earthquake. Uh, and it would actually be um, tens of seconds later uh, before you'd feel it here. Tens of seconds. Tens, tens. tens. Uh, so, a, uh, so something to give, you, to give you something to do during an earthquake, when you feel that first jolt, uh, what you want to do once you're either under your desk or in the door gym, uh, you can start counting. And that first jolt, and then you uh, count 1,001, 1, 1,002. And with each second, that's telling you that that rupture surface uh, is about 8 miles away. So if you counted 10 seconds, that's about 80 miles. Um, so the coast is, what, 100 and 50 miles from here, so that's probably, what, that's going to be about 20 seconds, or something like that. So, 20 seconds, you'll be feeling it over here. Yes? Speaking of hearing, if you're in your, in your residence and this happens, you're the safest place to be is there probably, if it's a stick frame house like most of our building is. So, that makes sense. What if you're in a building like this? It's all masonry, has equipment hanging all over the ceiling, and all over the Okay, the question is, 
if we're all in the Tower Theater when this happens, and we're not in, we're not in a, a, a wood frame home or our residence, which might be safer, what do you do? Is this where you do the airplane crash position? <laughs> There's only room for three of us here, by the way. something solid and hold on. If if we're in this building and it's not solid, obviously we want to get out if we can, but if you can get under something solid, it's a drop cover and hold it down. I forget that next is something solid, not under. There's some theories. Um, what, and what did you say, sir? That it's better to be next to something solid. Okay, is it better to be next or under? under. There, there's a theory, and I think they call it care with no yeah, but that's been proven. Um, that's been proven not to be the case, and so they're back to drop, cover, and hold, and that's what they're teaching in the schools and stuff. So there is a lot of there's, there's a lot of things on the ceilings that and you saw some many of the pictures that are gonna that can come down and hit you on the head, and so being underneath something is really a better place. Okay, the uh, lady right there, yes. A little louder, please. Okay, uh, back up for the uh, community kitchen. Well, when there's a disaster, we um, shelter, clothe, and food anybody displaced from a disaster. And that does, that means if, if you were living in a tent or your car or under a bridge, you're, we shelter you, feed you, and clothe you. Okay. Recording? Yep. Um, so, is there uh, earlier a warning system that turns from the southern Pardon me? Uh, is there a is warning? There a warning system that turns from the southern Northwest. Okay, is there a warning system for the Northwest? <coughs> decided to test them here about three or four years ago. And what happened was half of them didn't work because they hadn't been dried in so long from salt air and so forth. And those that did work, the people didn't know what they were doing. So, so yes and no. <laughs> like tonight, maybe we can get a passing grade soon. Go ahead.
Okay, we've got time for two more questions. Yes, Ray. What's the level of preparedness and coordination management in case you have a wildfire at the same time you're on the oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, question is, are, what, what, what's the level of, of preparedness if we're experiencing a wildfire at the same time? <laughs> yeah. no. Okay. I, I think actually that's, it sounds terrible, but that's a very yeah. good question. Um, depending on when this event happens, there's other seasonally uh, predictable disasters that could be occurring. It could be August 1st and we could have wildfire. It could be February 1st and we have a significant snow event. We could have a significant rain on snow event that causes flooding. I mean, it could happen, right? We have no idea to predict when the earthquake would happen. So we would handle that. Uh, the same way we would handle it, yes, infinitely more difficult. However, again, we would be prioritizing those services and those resources to go to do the most good for most people at that time. Again, that especially highlights the need for people to be able to take care of themselves until we can get to it. Okay, one more question. Yes. Assuming uh, people can get here from across the mountains, there's a huge potential for evacuees. How many could we accommodate? How many evacuees could we accommodate from the west side of the mountains? Um, I know that the fairgrounds are set up to handle 20 to 25,000. Um, you know, we'd have to open every school. Like I said, a lot of the churches are, are preparing. Um, who knows? The numbers I've heard are anywhere from 100,000 to a million refugees. And uh, I've talked to the mayors of some of the other communities. And if you think about it for a minute, the mayors of, or the, the communities of Madras, Sisters in Lapine are the three first cities that refugees would hit. And so when I asked the mayor of Sisters, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to tell them that Redmond and Bender are right down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at Polina myself. <laughs> All right, so post, yes. Okay. Um, Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Yes. Dean Scott at Oregon State University, Lisa Stroop from American Red Cross, Sergeant Doom, Nathan Garrigan from Deschutes uh, County, and uh, Redmond Mayor George Endicott. Uh, yes, find out more and uh, and we hope that you're walking away with some valuable information as well in addition to simply being prepared um, as you leave we want to remind you the Red Cross volunteers will have some information for you we encourage you to grab this pamphlet as you leave uh, and if you haven't done so check out the, the Red Cross displays in the lobby uh, thanks again to our speakers to our sponsors to the Tower Theater uh, for bringing this event to you all and good night